This episode, I'm speaking to Dr. Pamela Klassen about the James Webb Space Telescope, the Square Kilometre Array Organisation, and what we can expect from this new generation of observatories. So my name is Dr. Pamela Klassen. I'm an astronomer and senior project scientist at the UK Astronomy Technology Centre. Great. Well, thanks very much for uh, joining me in the podcast today, Pamela. It's, it's great to have you here. Um, lots to discuss. Lot, lots been going on in the, in the past few weeks. I suppose we just start off by um, exploring a little bit about what you do and what your work is. Um, I, I understand that in terms of your research, you're, you're interested in massive stars and, and, and how they form. But you're also uh, an instrument scientist. I was wondering if you could sort of tell us a little bit about what you're, what, what you're interested in and what you do on a day-to-day basis. Sure. So I think I've lucked out in the, in the job category. I get to both do awesome science as well as ensure that the next generation of telescopes and instruments are as good as we can make them. So as an astronomer, what I'm interested in is understanding what sets the upper mass limit for a star. We know approximately how stars form, um, like the sun, but what we don't know is how the most massive stars in the universe form. And so when I say the most massive, you know, we can, we have a pretty good understanding of stars like the sun and and how they form. But once we get up above about 10 times that mass, models start breaking down and we don't have a handle on how we can get the material in onto a star. And we've seen stars that are more than 100 times the mass of the sun. So we've got a real dilemma in there, and that's what I'm interested in studying. On the instrument science side of things, uh, what I'm able to do is um, be there as the instruments and as the telescopes are being developed and make sure that they are the best that we can deliver for the next generation of science. So... You know, I've been involved in James Webb for the last eight years. I've been involved in the Square Kilometre Array Observatory for a similar amount of time. And we're really, you know, pushing the, the engineering and the technology f- forwards to be able to get the best science out of these facilities. I think you're right when you said that you uh, lucked out because uh, <laughs> both both really, really interesting and, and, and cool things to be studying. It's really interesting that what you were saying about the sort of missing pieces in terms of our knowledge of how those massive stars form. How can we hope to solve some of, the, some of those mysteries? What, what sort of observatories and, and, and missions might, might help us do that? So I will get my hands on as much data as I possibly can uh, to try and understand this. But really, we're looking at long wavelength astronomy to get this. So things from James Webb all the way through uh, to radio astronomy uh, and the square kilometer array with these observatories, we can kind of get past all of the uh, dust that gets in the way that obscures um, star forming regions and really poke into their hearts and look at how the material is evolving, how it's moving so that we can put constraints on models of star formation. Is it essentially sort of trying to understand the uh, physics by which it's, it's actually possible for these stars to be produced? Yeah, that's it exactly. Once we get above about 10 times the mass of the sun, these um, protostars, as we call them, you know, things that will become stars, they start burning hydrogen brightly enough to ionize their surroundings and they push their natal material outwards. So all of the material around the forming star gets pushed outwards. And so the big question is, with all of those outward pressures, you know, all that material being pushed outwards, how do you still get material in to continue to build up the mass of the star. And that's what we're trying to understand. I know the two subjects aren't necessarily related, but in, in my sort of layperson understanding of it, it, it sort of reminds me of dark matter problem in that there, there seems to be a missing piece of the puzzle where, whereby the, the mass doesn't quite work. Yeah, exactly that. So we, we've, we've got the problem that, you know, all the material should be going outwards, but we see that kind of end result of a hundred, you know, stars that are a hundred times the mass of the sun. So there's a disconnect there of, of how that happens. And I'm hoping facilities like Webb and, and the Square Kilometre Array will help answer that. Coming on to the, the Square Kilometre Array and um, the Webb Telescope, that sort of leads nicely nice into your, you know, your, your work as, as, as an instrument scientist. How do you balance, um, how do you balance working out the mystery of massive stars with, you know, helping um, design and engineer 
instruments that are going to be launched into space or are going to be huge, huge radio telescope arrays? So I come at it from the approach of how can we get the best science out of these facilities? Right, so my day-to-day -day work is making sure that they're easy to use, that we understand all of their properties so that we can get rid of all of the telescope effects um, when we're looking at the data. So that's kind of my view into the system and how I can balance those two because I really wanna get the interesting science out. And I know everybody else does too. So that's my hat, if you want, in, in that, that kind of ecosystem of building telescopes is I'm trying to make sure that the science stays at the forefront. That's pretty awesome. I mean, the um, MIRI system is a, a, a instrument on, on web is already making a, a name for itself. The, those images that were released uh, a few weeks ago, what, I suppose it's worth just going back to the, the, the basics. What, what actually is the MIRI instrument and, and how does it work and, and how is it contributing to the web's images and data? Right, so we have to remember that Webb itself is an infrared telescope. It, it observes light from the near infrared to the mid infrared. It's got four instruments, three of which study near infrared light. So that's near cam, that's nearest, and that's near spec. There's also a fourth instrument, MIRI, uh, the M of which stands for mid infrared because it's the only mid infrared instrument on the observatory. So when we're looking at the images that are coming both from, from press releases, but also the data coming into scientists at this point, we've got a few different ways of, of looking at the information that the telescope can provide us. So the mid-infrared instrument, which is what MIRI stands for, um, is looking at the longest wavelength emission that James Webb is sensitive to. So here, you know, for, for those who want to know the, the, the science of it, we're looking at five to 28 microns emission. So we're really looking at what's called the thermal infrared. And to kind of put that into a bit of context, your skin, for instance, is a thermal infrared detector. If you go out on a sunny day and you feel the sun on your skin, you're observing this, you're, you're um, seeing the same light that Miri is seeing. It's just a heck of a lot more sensitive. I suppose actually the question is, why infrared? And actually also, what, what is the difference in what we see and, and, and analyze with infrared and near infrared? The reason we go to the infrared is because we get a different way of looking at things. So one of the interesting uh, analogies that I've heard recently, looking at things in the infrared is kind of like reading a sentence in a different language. You get a different view of the same thing. Right, so with the, with the infrared, as I was saying earlier, you can really get into the heart of a optically obscured region. So you think of the, the Milky Way, you know, the, the images of that, it's got dark lanes right through the middle. In the infrared and at longer wavelengths, we can see into those dark lanes and really see what's going on inside of them. And that's, for instance, where stars are forming. So we're getting a different view of the same objects to try and, and piece together what's going on. Yeah, I think I, I, I sort of saw that when the um, those first uh, web web images came out. Um, I was I was taking a look because it was a, a lot of people online were on, on sort of social media were showing and he, and here's the same object as it was seen by Hubble and, and look at the difference. And one of the things I noticed was with um, the uh, Stefan's Quintet image, zooming in on one of the galaxies, and you zoomed in the same galaxy with Hubble. With Hubble, it was a lot more opaque, but with Webb, you could actually see through... Are you, are you basically seeing through the dust? Is that what it is? Exactly what we're doing, yeah. And with the mid-infrared instrument, with MIRI, um, that's a, a very good example of how, instead of it being dark and opaque, the red stuff in, in the, those images, which was kind of the uh, interaction between the galaxies, that was the, the MIRI emission from there. And that's really showing you how those galaxies are interacting with each other. And that's not something we had seen with Hubble in nearly as much detail or nearly as much science in there. So it's really, like I said, looking at it from a different point of view or in a different language to understand more about what's going on there. That must really um, sort of play into your your own research in terms of actually being able to look through the sort of interstellar dust and, and, and see those massive stars in action. Yeah. So for me, the most interesting uh, image that came out of the, the release a couple of weeks ago was the image of Carina. 
Uh, it's a massive star forming region um, not too far from here. Uh, it's in our galaxy. And just looking at that and seeing all of the new protostars in there that were shining that we just never seen before. And it's a whole new wealth of information to start um, uh, looking at to see how our models of star formation fit or don't fit with those observations. And isn't it also the case that not, not only are the images in comparison to Hubble so much more detailed, but they take like a, a fraction of the time to, to generate? Yeah. So the deep field, for instance, that was released in the early release observations, I think they say it took about 12 hours of web time, whereas the equivalent with Hubble, Hubble was well over a week. So we're really doing, you know, things so much faster with web and so much deeper with web. And we're seeing further back in time as well and seeing much more distant galaxies. So again, does that sort of play, play into your research? Because we're effectively looking back into time, then you can, you can see those, those uh, massive stars potentially sort of evolving over time or, or, or what they were at least like in their, in their, in their infancy? So we can see the galaxies uh, in the, the beginning of the universe. We can't see the indig individual massive stars. We also know that at the beginning of the universe, there wasn't nearly as many heavy elements as we see today. So star formation happened very differently at the beginning of the universe. Uh, what happens now is, so if we think about what the life cycle of a star, especially a, a massive star, when they go supernova, they create all of the heavy elements. So all of the elements, for instance, in a one pound coin are the remnants of, came from the remnants of a supernova. So the first stars didn't have that heavy, those heavy elements available to them to help them uh, form and help them cool and, and let the, the material condense. So they had a very different way of forming uh, from the one that I'm studying in our local universe, in our galaxy. One of the things I was wondering was the reasons why JWST, uh, the images are, are so much clearer than Hubble. How, how, how much of it is to do with just decades of progress in the technology? And, and how much is it to do with the, the fact that JWST is, is, is orbiting so much, so much further out? You know, it, 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 it's, in a, it's in a different position to Hubble. So I think both of those are important. I think the year's worth of technology development has meant that we could have a much larger mirror in space. This is the first time we've had a deployable mirror on this scale, you know, available to be put into space. And so we've got a much larger collecting area, which means we, we can see, the, you know, we can um, see things that are much fainter, much quicker, right? That, that increases our sensitivity of the telescope but also the much larger um, telescope means that we can see things much more precisely and with much more fine detail than we could ever see before. So moving things out to much larger orbits, um, that has to do partially with the wavelength range that we're observing. It's the same reason we have the sun shield, right? This, the sun, the earth, the planets, they all emit really brightly in the infrared. And so we had to mask as much of that as possible. So James Webb could not have worked nearly as well as it does now. We couldn't have had a mid-infrared instrument if it was uh, in low Earth orbit like Hubble. I was also going to ask you about, um, there's two other aspects of the, of the MIRI instrument that I was um, looking at. And one of them is this thing called um, coronagraphy. <laughs> Coronography, <then> yeah. <laughs> And then there's uh, spectroscopy, and I'm, I'm a bit more okay mm -hmm. with the with the latter. But I was wondering if you could explain the former because my sort of basic uh, research into it made it just sound um, absolutely in incredible, really. So coronography is basically the art of blocking part of the light coming through the telescope. Um, so if you think about it, when you you're outside on on a sunny day and you're trying to read a sign, but the sun's behind it or, you know, just above it, and you can't actually see the sign. You put your hand out to kind of block the sun so that you can see the dimmer thing that's um, that, that you're most interested in. And that's exactly what we do with coronography, but much more precisely than putting your hand to block the sun. So we've got um, part of Miri is specifically dedicated. We know we can point the telescope very precisely and we can put the star behind basically a mask. And we can then reconstruct 
the low, the faint emission around it. And the idea here is to look for exoplanets. So we can block the light from the star and see the much dimmer planets around it. And what about spectroscopy? Because that's a, that's a whole sort of interesting branch of, of astronomy in itself, isn't it? Absolutely. So most of the science that I do involves spectroscopy. Uh, what we're doing there is we're splitting the light up. You know, kind of, there are prisms um, on the telescope and we're splitting the light up into the rainbow uh, of its constituent light. And with that, when we see something that's, for instance, you know, popping up at, at one specific wavelength, we know that that is some molecule or some grain of dust or, or you know, some rare jewel. You know, we can see um, sapphires, for instance, with Miri. And with that information, we can understand better what's... Uh, a star forming region is made up of. And also we can see to the very early universe how these same lines are shifted through wavelength because as the universe is expanding, light um, is, is what we call red shifted. It goes to longer wavelengths. So that's why all of these uh, new galaxies are popping up in all of these mirror images that we've seen um, and all of the, the web images in general is because we're seeing galaxies that were just far too redshifted to see with facilities like Hubble. And we can use spectroscopy to get much more precise distances to these, these galaxies that we're seeing. So we know if it's only showing up in Miri, it's already very redshifted. But then if we look at the spectrum, we can see the difference between something that's you know 12 billion years old and 13 billion years old. Let's move on to uh, the, the, the other big project that you're involved in, which is the... Uh square kilometer array, um, mm -hmm. which is a ground-based um, observatory. Um, I was wondering if, if you yes. could tell us about that and, and uh, how you're involved in that. Sure. So the square kilometer array observatory is a very long wavelength uh, observatory. So this is a, a radio telescope. Uh, it's got two sites. So there's the low telescope in Western Australia, and there's the what we call mid telescope in southern Africa. And so these telescopes uh, use slightly different technologies from each other, let alone from Webb. Uh, but what we're looking at here is um, very long wavelength radio astronomy, and we're doing it with uh, instruments that we call interferometers. So in, in, the, in Western Australia, we've got a bunch of, the technical term is dipole antennas, but they really look like a cross between Christmas trees and coat hangers in the desert. Um, very cool technology there. And then in Southern Africa, we've got things that look more like what people would expect a radio telescope to look like. We've got a bunch of dishes scattered across um, the, the Southern part of the continent there. And here we're looking at, as I said, you know, radio waves. And we're doing it with a bunch of uh, dipoles and a bunch of antennas scattered all over the place because that's the only way that we can get the sensitivity and resolution that we need in order to get anywhere close to the resolution of, of Hubble or Webb. Because our resolution of a telescope kind of scales with the wavelength of light that we're looking at. And you go to the longest wavelengths and you get the lowest resolution. So we had to come up with um, technologies that would let us have, you know, a, a telescope that has a collecting area of a square kilometer, hence the name square kilometer array, but doesn't actually take up that much space. We can't really find anywhere that um, would allow us to do that. We also don't have the technology to build a rigid, one monolithic rigid structure that could withstand that as well as move around the sky. So what we do instead in interferometry is we compare the signals coming in to a bunch of antennas or dipoles spread, spread across a wide area and infer what's going on in the sky from the comparing the, uh, the data from all of the different antennas. Ah, okay, because my, my understanding, of, and which is obviously a very basic understanding of um, interferometry was that it's effectively, if, if you have one, one observatory in South Africa and one observatory in Australia, the uh, 
collecting power is like the distance between the two. So you're effectively creating a, a telescope that size without having to collect a telescope that size. But it's, it sounds like I've slightly, slightly misunderstood it. <laughs> so that's kind of, that, that's, I don't think you've misunderstood it. I think that's just a, a unique characteristic of the square kilometer array. If you think, for instance, the Event Horizon Telescope, that's exactly what's happening. You know, we're using telescopes all across the world. And yes, that we get information on those large, what we call baselines between those observatories. But because the, uh, the low and the mid parts of the observatory are working at different wavelengths, we can't combine the data like the way you were just describing. Ah, right. Okay. Okay. When you look at square kilometer array and what's, what it's going to be doing, you, you do find a lot of the science goals and the targets sort of, for obvious reasons, overlap with, with those of the Webb telescope. Mm -hmm. Will those two observatories sort of um, complement each other and, and, and work in tandem and, and sort of work, work together? Very much so. Um, so if you think about, for instance, you know, one of the key science goals of Webb is to see the first galaxies in the universe. One of the key science goals of the square kilometer array is to see just before that, because obviously it's next generation, you have to do that that little bit further. Uh, but the, what I mean by that is the square kilometer array is really good at looking at neutral hydrogen. So this is just, you know, the, the, the most of the gas that pervades the universe. And it's not, it's, it's the stuff that the first stars were formed out of. And we can see that very clearly, or we hope to be able to see that very clearly with the square kilometer array. And that's giving us the building blocks for the first stars, which then form the first galaxies that Webb is able to see. It's absolutely incredible, isn't it? I mean, do you, like, do you think that, that this is it? You know, like we are completely about to witness like almost like, a, and it sounds like hyperbole, but like it, it sort of seems like we're on the cusp of like a, a new era of, of astronomy, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I also thought that about the ALMA Observatory when it started, when it had first light 10 years ago. Um, just it's it's a step change in our understanding. You know, you, you think about the the difference between the the predecessor to Webb is not Hubble; it's actually the Spitzer Space Telescope was observing at the same wavelengths, and we went from a telescope that was less than a meter across to a telescope that was more than six meters across. Right, so you've got this huge, like you know, factor of fifty to a hundred times improvement of what we can do. The same thing happened with, with ALMA. It was just, you know, 100 times better than anything we'd ever done before. Square kilometer array is, again, going to do the thing. And so to have three of these revolutions in my working career is just fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, do, do you ever think, where do we go from here? Or is it a bit early to be thinking about that? I mean, presumably Web, you know, Web, <laughs> Web and, and SKAO will be, be giving us data for decades to come, won't they? Yeah, so you've asked the right person that question because part of my job as an instrument scientist is to think about what are the next telescopes that we want and need and then setting the groundwork for those. So I'm involved in a, in a project to look at um, creating a new telescope to be highly complementary to ALMA. For instance, we've called it ATLAS, the Atacama Large Aperture Submillimeter Telescope. So it's looking at the same wavelength ranges as ALMA but instead of being an array, uh, you know, an interferometer, it's what we call a single dish telescope. So this is one monolithic uh, dish that we can observe uh, the same wavelengths as ALMA, and we can pick off the large scale structure that ALMA can't see. And why something like this is important is because we can do beautiful surveys of, for instance, our galaxy to look for star, for, for star forming regions. And then we can use ALMA to follow up and get the details. But ALMA has a very small, what we call field of view, it can only see a, a very small part of the sky at any one time. One of the goals of ATLAST is to see a very large part of the sky at one time. It'll be lower resolution, but we can get that big picture and then feed that into ALMA. So absolutely, we're definitely looking at the next generation of telescopes, always looking to the horizon. Yeah, I mean, at, at, at the start of at the start of our chat here, I was sort of asking, you know, how how, how do you balance those, those those two areas? You know, your 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 research into stars and your your work as an instrument scientist. 
But actually, over the over the past sort of twenty twenty five minutes, it's it's become it's become obvious to me now that like those those two spheres ha- have to work together, but be, because you have to know what we want to know in order to be able to know what we need to know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's a it's a great place to be, you know, using the the technology that we're developing. You know, and seeing that and, and knowing how to interpret data from web and how to interpret data from the square kilometer array and when it starts. So that definitely gives me an advantage. Um, I don't have to, I don't have that steep learning curve of how do I get this data to do what I want it to do? I already know what, what it needs to do. <laughs> do, you, do you ever think about either space telescopes f- even further out or if we're talking about radio telescopes, pushing them further out into the solar system? Could, could, could you envision like an interferometer on Mars or like, you know, like one dish on Mars and one on the moon and one on Earth and, and just create a, a ridiculously huge array? That would be awesome. Um, I have heard rumors and, and a few talks over the past couple of years of people wanting to put um, telescopes on the far side of the moon, like radio, radio arrays, uh, kind of similar to SKA low on the far side of the moon. The problem is we need to know where those antennas are with such high precision, right? Because it's the knowing where the antennas or the dipoles are gets us that information of where we're looking. And so being able to position things so accurately on the moon or on Mars is going to be very tricky. We have to get it to within a few nanometers, in order to to understand things properly and and being able to do that remotely we don't have the technology for that yet and then is is there an issue with the the fact that the moon is tidally locked that uh, a telescope on the far side of the moon would would never face us like is is that an issue in terms of um the the accuracy and and knowing where it is so that's not an issue for accuracy but that is an issue for getting data back to us we'd have to have some kind of relay station I mean, there's just so much to look forward to. I mean, it, 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 it sort of, it, it feels a bit silly talking about this now when, you know, like web's only, data's only really be, and the images have only just been made available to the public, but plenty to come, I think, it, it sounds like. So um, much, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I uh, hope you'll uh, stay in touch with us and, and let us know um, how, how your work's going and, and we'll get you the podcast again sometime in the near future, hopefully. Um, but yeah, I found it just to say thanks, thanks for joining me today and speaking to me and it's been great to talk to you. And th- thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. And yeah, I think I'm also looking forward to seeing what these observatories will, will bring in the few, next few months and next few years. It's going to be an exciting time. Mm-hmm.